Are you okay? Okay. Good. <laughs> the unicycle is commonly seen in circus acts, something for clowns to ride. It was first discovered in the late 19th century. It wasn't ridden by rainbow haired men in tents, but in fact evolved out of the world's first bicycles that were still works in progress. People discovered it by riding their bikes the wrong way. And in those days, a bike was a, a penny farthing or ordinary with a huge front wheel and a tiny little back wheel. That was the, the bike of choice around, I think, around the 1880s, 1890s or so. Anything that stops it too much, uh, it's going to put your center of mass in front of the axle and then it gets ugly and it's called a header. You know, you're going to fall on your head because the handlebars keep you from escaping. I have ridden one of those penny farthings and you know how on a, on a regular bike you pull the front and back brake to, evenly to make sure you don't go over the handlebars? Well, it doesn't work like that on that penny farthing. If you pull them both evenly and it locks up both wheels, you're going to go, I went right over the handlebars. <laughs> Um, recovered, okay. Doing a header uh, in the old days was uh, a pretty big deal because the bikes had like 60 inch wheels and so that's a long way down. So they were kind of dangerous. People speculate that because that front wheel was a big wheel and was a direct drive and no chain that um, people were leaning forward and picking up the back wheel off the ground and just riding it around like that. Or they took it apart and uh, rode just the front wheel. So uh, most of uh, the world's early unicycles were probably uh, penny farthings with the back end taken off, which means they didn't have seats, they just had handlebars. As bike technology improved, people started back riding bicycles. However, even today, people still ride unicycles, even though their counterparts have become a more efficient form of transportation and a faster one. I hear a lot of people tell me, well, you could go faster on a bicycle. Well, yeah, and you could tell a bicyclist they could go faster on a motorcycle. They're not riding that bike to go fast, they're riding it because they enjoy it. It's about doing it. Why ride a bike when you could drive? I don't know. I think the thing that was so fascinating about a unicycle was the fact that I was riding on one wheel as opposed to two. The guy that wrote a couple of books, he said, oh, well, unicycling is actually the most idiotic form of transportation. It's because it's not, it's not, it's a lot of energy that you put into it and the output is not very good, unlike the bicycle. You can't freewheel on a unicycle. You, um, you know, you, you're it. Your leg power is what's riding you on that unicycle. Like if you only get a kitchen pass for an hour, you have a four mile loop that's your, at your local trail. The unicycle, you can actually go out and ride one lap and you will have your workout like if you were to ride 20 miles on a bike. You do a bike, some guys are like, that's not even worth driving to the trailhead and putting spandex on to go ride the, you know, four mile loop. Mainly speed, you know, and, uh, and the crotch pain. You don't get that as much on the bicycle. They say unicycling for men takes a special kind of fortitude. And, uh, and it's, it's largely about having the right kind of seat uh, on your uni, knowing how to sit on it. I do kind of favor the unicycling a little bit more just because it's simpler, it's less maintenance going on, and, it, and, and you just get so much more attention. You, you get your five minutes of fame is what we like to call it for everybody that rides a unicycle where there's nobody else in the area. I don't mind standing out from the crowd. Uh, in fact, if you don't like standing out from the crowd, you're going to pick the bike. When I was still coming up with the idea of Unicycle.com. Um, I mentioned to my father-in-law that I was thinking about selling unicycles online. And of course, I was still working for IBM full-time at, at that time. And he's, he's, his first question was, well, how many clowns do you know? <laughs> the, the funny thing is, we don't sell that often to clowns. I mean, you know, it, it may be 1% of our total sales. The rest is all just folks like us, just looking for a challenge, something to have a good time. If you meet a guy that can ride a unicycle, one thing you know about him already they're a person who can fall down a hundred times and just keep getting up and trying it. The fact that it's a unicycle, you know, I mean like, nobody else does it. While the unicyclist is still a rare sight to see, the number of unicycles have multiplied and changed. And with it, so have the ways people ride them. I started riding in 1986 and uh, I had a, a Schwinn unicycle. Back then, there weren't a lot of good unicycles in the world, not like there are today. 
And uh, I didn't know there were all these wonderful things you could do with unicycles. And back then, neither did most other people. It was just riding around for clowns. There's a whole new area where the, the, the type of riding that people can do. But also, the fact is, there are more unicycles today available. I think we got over 100 different models. Um, the, you know, these didn't exist before. When, I, when we started out 10 years ago, there were 12. There's, gosh, there's so many styles and so many that are similar to other styles. If you talk to 100 different unicyclists, they could each name 100 different styles that are just blends of the others. One of the oldest and first styles of unicycle riding is called freestyle. This type of riding is designed for audience entertainment, but can involve some of the hardest tricks done on a unicycle. Many of the first freestyle riders showcase their talents in performances. Earliest riders to gain fame outside of the cycling world were entertainers. And so they, what they essentially did was what we call freestyle now. They did shows with unicycles. You're in a gym most generally or on a tennis court or somewhat of a smooth surface. And for lack of a, a better word for it, it's really ballet on a unicycle. Or if you're familiar with the bike industry and the kids that have the flatland cycles where they walk all over their bike, it's essentially what the unicycle word is. They call it freestyle. Your object is to entertain and do hard tricks. You know, show us skill, but in a entertainment and audience-based format. But, uh, it's amazing, amazing what uh, freestylers can do. People started to venture out of the gym and off flat surfaces. It was discovered that unicycles could be ridden on rough terrain. The best thing about Muni, or mountain unicycling, is, uh, is coming out in the, the open air and enjoying the day. Pretty much just like mountain biking, it's self-explanatory. You just get out in the mountains, you go ride single track trails, double track trails, you're just out in the woods having fun. You're looking six feet in front of you all the time because there's either going to be a rock or, or a ravine or something that you're going to have to deal with. So you've got to make a decision quickly, depending on how fast you're going, on how you're going to deal with it. You fall all the time. Uh, just learning how to ride, even before you try Muni, you're going to fall a lot, and you just have to be okay with it. There's really no way around that, and you know, I'll, I'll come home a lot of times with blood running down my leg, but uh, I just feel all the more manly for it. The rider is responsible for their own safety. We want them to wear a helmet and wrist guards at a minimum. You know, because typically when you fall, it's just like a, a skateboard. You're going to go down on your hands, so you want a wrist guard to protect you. But when you're off, when you're going off road, you need more than that. And I always joke that when I when I get all my gear on, I look like I'm ready for combat because I've got elbow guards and you know full leg protectors and um, it's even ankle guards and boots. You can use your imagination more with the unicycle because if you see a bunch of sticks laying on the ground or rocks and you're like, oh, I wonder if I can hop on that. You know, it might take you an hour to ride that loop of the trail, but if you let your imagination, you know, run wild, you'll see a log off the side of the trail. You're like, oh, I want to try ride that log or try and jump up on it and make sure I can, you know, stick it. We're on a bike. You're going so fast, you don't even notice the signs marking the trail, let alone anything else. Guys that are mountain biking who really enjoy that, but when they try it on a unicycle, they realize it's, it is a challenge, and it challenges them more, and a lot of them have just gone to, straight to mountain unicycling. I don't like riding bikes on dirt. In fact, I'm not good at it. Uh, the trails that I love riding, the really hard ones, I wouldn't even take a bike on. I'd have to carry it. You're only going a certain speed, so actually unicycles are a lot safer. A uh, bike, you can actually go very fast. They're similar to motorcycles. You can get in over your head real quick and, you know, fly over the handlebars, hit, you know, trees, that kind of stuff, where with a unicycle, you can only go as fast as you can pedal, which, you know, usually is no more than 10 miles an hour. So if you crash, we call it an unplanned dismount or abbreviated UPD. And when you hit, it, when you have a UPD, most generally, unless there's a lot of rocks or roots to trip you up, you'll walk right off the cycle like you're stepping off a set of stairs or going faster, you run off of it like you're running downstairs. Second year, I think that the, the organization offered a competition for mountain unicycling. And when I first heard about that, I told Amy, these guys are nuts. I really said that. And then the funny thing is when I got out there, I rode down with Nathan and Bo and I, I had the time of my life. I think that's why the growth has been so much in the off-road unicycling now and it's getting a little bit more mainstream is the technology is finally catching up to the riding styles. Because when you know you have a guy that's trying to jump off of a roof of a house and do like a 10 foot drop to flat, that's really hard on the rim, really hard on the cranks, the hub, 
and just the stresses. Nowadays we have the technology and the resources to sell somebody a cycle that can do that you know, within $300, where back in the 80s, they didn't have nothing that could handle, you know, a five foot drop, unless you wanted to spend $1,500 on a unicycle. If you want to go up a hill, you have to pedal hard. And if you're coming down a hill, the wheel wants to roll right out from under you. So you got to push backwards on the pedal. You're not pushing forwards at all. You're just using your feet to slow down the unicycle. The idea is, is not, for me, it's not how fast you can go, but how long can you stay in the saddle? You know, because if, if you can stay on it and then get over the obstacle or around it or through it, you know, sometimes you just power through it. That's the fun part of it. Um, and each time you, you master one of these uh, obstacles, you get more confidence. Um, you, you could get them too, too confident, but, you know, you have to try it. And then you, that's where you find out what your limits are, and then you start practicing your skills. The more times you fall trying to do something, the greater sense of satisfaction and accomplishment once you finally nail it. I just like the challenge. I mean, you, you're always coming up on new stuff to, to try to do. And you know, if you fall, it's no big deal. You just get back, right back up and try it again until you, until you get it. It's totally worth it once you come tearing down the mountain on a unicycle and you get to the bottom and you say, wow, how many other people in the world could do that? <laughs> As the terrain got rougher and the unicycles improved, people started to push the envelope by jumping on things and in doing so, Trials Unicycling was born. People out there on the trails would uh, start uh, climbing and riding on more and more challenging uh, terrain, which uh, a lot of times you need to be able to hop up things to uh, progress up a trail or, uh, or jump across gaps and this and that. And uh, people started getting into that as an activity of its own. And that's where you hop up on a picnic table um, hop on rocks, different obstacles like that. So there's no tricks or, or, or technique or as far as uh, visual technique, no style involved. It's just a matter of getting from A to B without falling off. When you get to where you can jump off a three foot platform and not die <laughs> or not break anything. These things didn't exist uh, before the times that they did because the equipment didn't exist. As unicycles have continued to improve, so have the riders. With skateboarding and trials as an influence, people started to do a whole new style of riding called street. You do some of the session sport of the trials, but you mix in some of the tricks. So they took the trials obstacles and started doing tricks on them or off of them. Like you'll be riding along and you'll see a rock, you'll jump up on the rock, and then as you jump down off of the rock, as soon as you hit the ground, you do a one foot where you're pedaling with one foot and your other foot's on the frame. These guys have used a skateboard as kind of a, a jumping off point and invented all kinds of new tricks. Uh, one of the basic moves is a crank flip. That's where you jump up in the air and the wheel spins under, you know, you give the pedals a push and take your feet off and the wheel flips around once or twice or whatever and you land with your feet back on the pedals. Taking an idea from the past, people began riding on large wheels again. In doing so, a commuting touring style came about, and with it came unicycle races. It's just like the bike world, a commuting, uh, it's kind of commuting, touring, and long distance is kind of slammed together. You ride on a very large wheel, larger wheels go faster. The size of the wheel is the gear size. So if you want to go faster over long distance, like touring on the road or right across the country, the biggest size they make is a 36 inch wheel. So that can make you average anywhere between nine miles an hour to about 14, 15 miles an hour. There's a competition every two years called Ride the Lobster. It was not uh, thought up by unicyclists, oddly enough. It was thought up by um, marketing and uh, tourist uh, promoters in Nova Scotia, Canada an area that does not have uh, any kind of big unicycle community. It was pretty much the first of its kind. The ride had 35 teams, there were four on each team, three of them were riders, and one was a support person. People traveled worldwide. There was people from, you know, Korea, China, um, New Zealand, the UK, uh, uh, the US, and there was a lot of can uh, people from Canada also. Four days they were doing it, it was roughly 125 miles a day, three riders were doing it, and Nova Scotia is not flat. They had um, where you could see the terrain, 
And you could see the hills and what they had to climb, um, and it was phenomenal what these riders went through. Uh, they had uh, GPS tracking us, so you could actually check where we were at physically on the computer. Just what it did for the sport was great to get it out there. We had press and um, they had weather conditions they had to deal with. That size, the Tour de France size and the media coverage and sponsorship and stuff like that, nobody has anything in the works because it took them about two to three years to actually plan the Ride the Lobster. There's a lot of smaller groups going on rides, like they'll go do a Vietnam ride and it's usually a smaller group of about 12 people. The Ride the Lobster actually included about 106 people. With all the different styles of riding, there's a need for a wide variety of unicycles. Although these cycles are easy to find now, that was not the case 10 years ago. A lot of times back then, and even today, people will ask me, hey, that's a cool thing, where do you get a unicycle? And so I heard it so often that I started thinking, you know, maybe we should consider selling this. And, and Amazon had just, you know, made a, a big splash with their books. And I thought, you know, maybe we could try this thing on the internet. We started in our house. John was originally going to make it just a little informational website. It wasn't going to be a company. We didn't start off saying, hey, you know, let's start a business plan and have it all set. You go live and, you, you know, you're sitting around, okay, let's see what's going to happen. Nothing happened for 11 days. And then finally we got an order for not a unicycle, but a little um, device that you attach to your helmet that is a, a rear view mirror so you can peek up and see behind you. So it was a $12 sale. I mean, it was nothing, but to us, it could have been a million dollars. You know, because all of a sudden we realized it works. The process works. As it took over our household, which it did, it took over our basement, my son's room, the kitchen. Um, we were, I was managing the property next door. We used their huge garage for storage. I mean, you've got an 18-wheeler coming down your road, unloading product and you're Directing traffic around this truck, it's pretty funny. We knew it was time to find a place. At first, I didn't think we'd make a living at it. My, my, my real goal at first was just to get cycles at a lower cost because I mean, we were pension pennies, you know, we're on one income, and um, I, my wife wasn't going to take too kindly to me ordering a $500 unicycle every now and then, you know. So I thought that uh, if I could just sell enough unicycles to pay to get the ones I want, that would be pretty cool. And all of a sudden, it just took off. And within seven months, it got me out of my job. As Unicycle has grown and we've taken on franchises, we now have seven. There's nine of us in the world. Two of us are like sister companies, you know, Unicycle.com UK and the USA are sister companies. Um, the rest of them are actual franchises. They get together every year in Taiwan. And you know, all year they're talking about different product ideas. But uh, when they get together in Taiwan is when they can really sit, all sit together and look at blueprints and have things um, prototyped. Just grazing the surface of what, what we can do as a company and what we can do as far as our product line. It just takes us as a company to another level because if you have unicycles in different price points, then when someone comes to your site, just about anyone can find something they can afford. The, the unicycles are designed by unicyclists for unicyclists, so that is one of the prerequisites of our company is if you don't currently ride a unicycle, we strongly encourage you to learn how to ride a unicycle. Worldwide, we sell about 10,000 unicycles a year. Um, the U.S. is about six of that. Because of the success that we've had so far with Unicycle.com, that gave us uh, the basis to be able to launch a second internet-based company, Banjo.com. And these are, you know, they really don't have anything to do with each other. People ask me all the time, do you ride and play at the same time? And I always say it's really not good for the instrument. I see us right now where we are is where the mountain bike industry was in the 1970s. And they had just started coming out with mountain bikes and people were still going, you're kidding, you're going to ride a bike on the mountain trails, that's crazy. That's where unicycling is. You know, we've got our trials riders, we've got our mountain riders. It's growing in popularity as our sales grow, as our company grows. Like I said, we have five other countries that want to come on board. So there's people in those other countries asking for unicycles for these people. They contact us and say, hey, you know, we see your site, we see you have dealers, but I want to sell in my country, what do I do? Today, to be able to, to dream up something and have it prototyped and then come out into a model is just, it's really gratifying to think that we've come that far. And there, the sky's the limit now. I mean, this, the stuff that we've got planned, I can't really talk about yet. Uh, but uh, it's, there's some really exciting products coming down the road. Unicycling is getting bigger now than ever before, mainly because of the internet. 
Before we had easy communication and easy ways to look things up, it was really hard to find information about unicycles. Uh, you go into your local bike shop, and there's, uh, as far as unicycling is concerned, there's two kinds of bike shops. Uh, one is they have a guy who can ride and knows about unicycles and is interested, and the other kind is, well, we don't know about that stuff. Unicyclists are so rare, there's not a lot of people to ride with. But, uh, but then I got on the online forums. There's a forum called unicyclist.com, which is a community of unicyclists worldwide where they get on there and share tips and tricks. All you have to do now is go to Google, type in unicycle, and then dig to find the specific info you needed. That used to be impossible. Even before the easy communication, unicyclists organized events and competed against each other at conventions. The biggest surprise to me was in 1999, not too long after we started, uh, we, we found out there's a Unicycling Society of America. And they've been around now for something like 33 years. And uh, they, each summer they host this meet where people come from all over the, U the USA and Canada and they compete. Kind of like the Olympics of unicycling, you do everything in a week. They do indoor freestyle, uh, kind of like ballet on a unicycle. They also do track and field events. And then there's mountain unicycling, there's tri trials course they set up. One foot racing, backwards racing, it's really hysterical, some of it. With the unicycling community continuing to grow worldwide, the Olympics could be the next stage for the unicycle. There is a move to try to get the unicycle in the Olympics. Um, I've heard people openly talk about that. And I, I think what has to happen is that you have to have companies get together and fund big races that have, you know, substantial purses or winner, winner's share um, in order to attract the kind of attention. Um, I can see trials being in the Olympics because you set up an obstacle course and, um, you know, you, you are put to the test that way. I mean, it would be great because they've got all these other unusual sports in the Olympics. Why not need a cycling? I mean, beach volleyball. You know, I, I wouldn't have thought that would get in there, but um, it's a fun sport, and I'm glad it did. So if, if they can do it, I feel like unicycling can do it. We just got some more, um, we got to get more interest. I honestly would love to see it as popular as bikes are. Because, you know, it's, the, it's not the same type of sport, but it's in that same genre. If you can ride a bike, you can ride a unicycle. I, I, you know, I never want to see unicycles in like a Walmart because there isn't just one cycle for, per person like you can do in Walmart, a skateboard or you know, here's a bike for you know, this huge population. But I see the sport to be big enough where people, it's not going to be such an anomaly anymore. It's like, oh, you have a unicycle. Yeah, well, I got one too. It's just like a bike. So I, I see us being able to get that big. More and more people are learning to ride, but why and how are they doing it? People forget when they learned to ride a bike, they were mostly a kid, and they got on it every day until they got it. It's the same with a unicycle. You need to get on it every day, and you will get it. It's usually about 20 hours. I learned how to ride through sheer persistence. I mean, like, after I got my unicycle, I was just on it all the time, every single day. It took me probably like a month to learn how to get on it and ride pretty consistently, but I just, every day, I. I got down there and just practiced. Falling wasn't that big of an issue though for in, the, in the sense that it didn't really hurt because most of the time you landed on your feet. So that, that really is another motive for a, a beginner to start because you don't have to worry about falling and breaking your neck, just trying to learn. Adults sometimes have a harder time than kids learning because they have that fear factor that comes up right away. It was kids, they just go straight right at it. That I'm gonna learn to ride this and I don't care. And adults will think, if I fall off this thing, I'm going to get hurt. You know, kids don't think like that. They just they get it usually a little bit quicker. It takes a lot of guts to sit up there on top of that, uh, that wheel and have that sensation that you're falling all the time uh, and control it. I would just get out on the unicycle, you know, and I mean, you go 10 feet and like, like fall off, you know, but I mean, just keeping at it is, is the thing that helped me learn the most. Trial by fire best place, hands down, is a back deck. And if you've got a, a, a railing that's about waist high, that's perfect because, I mean, think about it, if, if you're getting on it and you're trying to get your balance, you're going to spend the first hour or so learning where your center of gravity is. After that, then we teach that, that you lean forward a little bit and just start pedaling slowly and hang on. Because if you fall forward, you just step off. You let the unicycle go. If you go backwards, it's going to hurt. That's when you want to be hanging on. First day I ever got out riding, and I started going, felt like leaned back too far and felt flat on my hindquarter. 
I mean, it, it, it was a pretty jarring experience. Oh, it was just a matter of just getting on it, just holding on to a wall, getting the feel for it, pushing away a few times, falling a lot more times. I remember the first time I actually got the wheel to go all the way around once without falling off. I was just ecstatic because I had fallen a hundred times trying to do that. It just made it feel so much better, such a sense of accomplishment. When you challenge people to, to ride on a unicycle or you, you give them your unicycle and say, hey, give it a try, it's that learning curve that they want to know and it's almost kind of addictive. Well, it is addictive. I have plenty of cycles to prove that it's addictive. I was so horrible at it at first. I mean, it was terrible. It was awful. Started setting a can, smashed can on the ground and I just Every time I got further, I'd set it wherever my last spot was, and eventually, before I knew it, I was going 50 plus feet, and just going. I got off when I decided to. And for me, it's extremely fun. I love doing it. You know, I mean, like, I didn't realize that I would love it this much until I actually started. But Lord have mercy. I mean, it's like one of the greatest things you get. I mean, like on a like I said, on a good day. I mean, like you just go out and ride, and that's the greatest thing you'll ever you'll ever do in your life. <laughs> you're constantly looking six feet in front of you because you're going to hit it in a few seconds. So if you um, hold off on the tape there, if, if you're going to um, come up to a... Jim, Jimmy? Scott? Hey, Steve, let's, let's hold off on the tape. That's all right. It's, it's just a killer. <laughs> Not that what I'm saying is interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's your crew because you guys are shipping the most stuff. <laughs> anyway, okay, back to safety. When, when you're riding. You got it, you got it. Yeah! <laughs> like to call it for everybody that rides a unicycle where there's nobody else in the area. I don't mind standing out from the crowd. Uh, in fact, if you don't like standing out from the crowd, you're going to pick the bike. When I was still coming up with the idea of Unicycle.com, um, I mentioned to my father-in-law that I was thinking about selling unicycles online. And of course, I was still working for IBM full-time at, at that time, and he's, he's, his first question was, well, how many clowns do you know? <laughs> The, the funny thing is, we don't sell that often to clowns. I mean, you know, it, it may be 1% of our total sales. The rest is all just folks like us. Just looking for a challenge, something to have a good time. If you meet a guy that can ride a unicycle, one thing you know about them already, they're a person who can fall down 100 times and just keep getting up and trying it. The fact that it's a unicycle, you know? I mean, like, nobody else does it. While the unicyclist is still a rare sight to see, the number of unicycles have multiplied and changed. And with it, so have the ways people ride them. I started riding in 1986. Rainbow haired men in tents, but in fact evolved out of the world's first bicycles that were still works in progress. People discovered it by riding their bikes the wrong way. And in those days, a bike was a, a penny farthing or ordinary with a huge front wheel and a tiny little back wheel. That was the, the bike of choice around, I think around the 1880s, 1890s or so. Anything that stops it too much, uh, it's gonna put your center of mass in front of the axle and then it gets ugly and it's called a header. You know, you're gonna fall on your head because the handlebars keep you from escaping. I have ridden one of those penny farthings and you know how on a, on a regular bike you pull the front and back brake to evenly to make sure you don't go over the handlebars. Well, it doesn't work like that on that penny farthing. If you pull them both evenly and it locks up both wheels, you're gonna go, I went right over the handlebars. <laughs> um, recovered, okay. Doing a header uh, in the old days was a, a pretty big deal because the bikes had like 60 inch wheels. And so that's a long way down. Actually the most idiotic form of transportation it's because it's not, it's not, it's a lot of energy that you put into it and the output is not very good, unlike the bicycle. You can't freewheel on a unicycle. You, um, you know, you, you're it. Your leg power is what's running you on that unicycle. 
Like if you only get a kitchen pass for an hour, you have a four mile loop that's your, at your local trail. The unicycle, you can actually go out and ride one lap and you will have your workout like if you were to ride 20 miles on a bike. You do a bike, some guys are like, that's not even worth driving to the trailhead and putting spandex on to go ride the, you know, four mile loop. Mainly speed, you know, and, uh, and the crotch pain. You don't get that as much on the bicycle. They say unicycling for men takes a special kind of fortitude. And, uh, and it's, it's largely about having the right kind of seat uh, on your uni, knowing how to sit on it. I do kind of favor the unicycling a little bit more just because it's simpler, it's less maintenance going on, and, it, and, and you just get so much more attention. You, you get your five minutes of fame is what we like. Are you okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> The unicycle is commonly seen in circus acts, something for clowns to ride. It was first discovered in the late 19th century. It wasn't ridden by... So they were kind of dangerous. People speculate that because that front wheel was a big wheel and was a direct drive with no chain, that um, people were leaning forward and picking up the back wheel off the ground and just riding it around like that. Or they took it apart and uh, rode just the front wheel. So uh, most of uh, the world's early unicycles were probably uh, penny farthings with the back end taken off, which means they didn't have seats, they just had handlebars. As bike technology improved, people started back riding bicycles. However, even today, people still ride unicycles, even though their counterparts have become a more efficient form of transportation and a faster one. I hear a lot of people tell me, well, you could go faster on a bicycle. Well, yeah, and you could tell a bicyclist they could go faster on a motorcycle. They're not riding that bike to go fast, they're riding it because they enjoy it. It's about doing it. Why ride a bike when you could drive? I don't know. I think the thing that was so fascinating about a unicycle was the fact that I was riding on one wheel as opposed to two. The guy that wrote a couple of books, he said, oh, well, unicycling is actually